may be seated. One of the things that I really love about the Christmas carols is how much articulate theology is packed into the carols. And as you read through the first Noel here, it's just uh, uh, it's loaded with it. You know, the one who is the creator. Let us all with one accord sing praises to our heavenly Lord that hath made heaven and earth out of nothing, of naught. And then the redemption by the blood of Christ. And with his blood, mankind hath bought. So um, I love Christmas carols. Wonderful time of the year. We should sing these more often, even at seasons of the year where nobody else is celebrating Christmas. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts tonight. The message entitled, Swimming on a Full Stomach. I know your mother's probably told you when you were a little kid, never go swimming on a full stomach because you might get cramps and then you will drown. And uh, But here we have the Apostle Paul exhorting them to go swimming on a full stomach. We're over in Acts chapter 27. Tonight we're looking at verses 38 through 44, but we'll start reading back in verse 14 so we get the intensity of the situation in which they find themselves. We're in Acts chapter 27. I'm going to start reading up in verse 14, though tonight we're actually preaching on verses 38 through 44. God's word for his people. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which, when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strike sail, and so were driven. And we, being exceeding tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. That's just sort of a aside to the captain of the ship who believed to go forward, and Paul said, don't. He's the one who lost his boat. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Always try to be with the person who's in the center of God's will. Safe place to be in spite of the troubles. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe, God, that there shall not, it shall be even as it was told to me, Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded, and found it twenty fathoms, and when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and found it fifteen fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the ship, out of the stern, and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under colors as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread, and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship two hundred three score and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the island, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind, and made towards shore. 
And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the foreport stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Amen. An incredible passage. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you again for your word. The excitement that it brings, the reality of life, the reality of what was going on in the days of the apostles, not all tinsel and roses, but a true battle for the faith. And we are their heirs. To us has been given that which has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. To us has been given the word of eternal life. To us has been given the responsibility of passing it to the next generation if our Lord should tarry. Father, we pray that you will grant us grace to do so. We pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that our Lord Jesus Christ would indeed be glorified. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Fascinating as we look at this passage here, because after they have eaten, they hoisted the mainsail. They were going to sail at full blast toward the shore. They had the wind behind them. The waves were coming in behind them, pushing them toward the land. They discovered a creek. They thought, if we can just get into the creek, maybe we'll be okay. So they, the soldiers cut off the boat which, by the way, is very interesting. They were interested in their own skin. <laughs> Even though the Apostle Paul was going to promise them that they would all make it safely to land, they were interested in their own skin. Later on, when they're about to kill the Apostle Paul, they're interested in their own skin. People do many things for their own skin's sake, and yet God uses that in the context of his sovereignty to accomplish his purposes and the good of his people. Amazing. Hoisting a mainsail in the midst of the worst hurricane, perhaps, of that entire century. And yet they did it. So let me give you a quick summary of where we've been. We looked at physical versus spiritual shipwrecks in verses 21 through 27. Last week we finished that. Up to that point, we tied in predestination, election, and the sovereignty of God to the predestined storms of life. We learned several things. Number one. We can always be confident that the storms in our lives are designed by God to cause us to reach the specific destination that he has planned for us. Remember what the angel told Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. You're going to make it out of this. There's a goal that God has set for us that's beyond our current circumstances and beyond what we can currently see. Paul looked at his multiple shipwrecks in life with confidence that God designed those things to make him into the man that God wanted him to be. When you look at the various horrible storms that have happened in your life, do you have the confidence that God brought those things into your life or allowed those things into your life to make you into the man or the woman that God wants you to be? If you feel emotional, mental, physical, spiritual pain because of some trial that you're now facing in your life, be sure that you have Paul's outlook on predestination and sovereignty. It's very important. That's why the Apostle Paul was able to make it through so much trouble in his life. Paul kept on going through intense trouble without giving up. Are you tempted to give up? You know, I think every one of us has been to that point someplace in our life where we said, you know, I'm really tired of it. I just want to give up. I just want to sort of blend into the woodwork. I don't want to stick out for Christ anymore. I don't want anybody even to know that I'm a Christian because I'm really tired of what I'm going through. And maybe if I just compromise a little bit and just blend in, all that trouble that I'm facing will stop. The devil will get attacking me. I'll quit having to worry about all this stuff around me in the world and the flesh and the demons. I just sort of float along. They hoisted the mainsail and made for the land. In the storms of life, you know, we can hoist the mainsail because we know that the winds of God will blow us to the correct destination. 
Embracing the doctrine of predestination gives you perfect confidence and peace to sail boldly through the horrifying and sometimes extended storms of life. Paul kept sailing through that intense trouble because he believed it was predestined for his good and for God's glory. God never allows things into his life or yours that does not fit perfectly into his ultimate divine plan. You've heard the illustration of looking at a tapestry from the underside and it's all a tangle and knots and gnarls of threads hanging down and you don't see any pattern. But when you look at it from above, you see the beautiful tapestry all spread out. We see the underside, but God sees the top, the things that he's weaving into our lives. Some storms, as we've talked about, have involved direct confrontation with Satan, involved direct confrontation with the vic vicious apostates, with violent governments, and some intense physical, mental, and emotional suffering. And yet Paul gloried in all of those things because it gave him confidence that he was squarely in the center of the will of God. Like with all this opposition from the devil, I must be doing something right. That brought us to the most dangerous kinds of shipwreck. Spiritual shipwreck is a completely different matter that does not have the benefits of the predestined storms of life. Paul described spiritual shipwreck to young Timothy in this way. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. This goes to the point of failing to handle the predestined storms of life in God's way. If you handle them in God's way, you can go through the storms of life and you will arrive safe on the other side. But if you fail to handle these predestined storms in your life, it will tempt you to make spiritual shipwreck. We saw there are many different kinds of spiritual shipwreck that you can have by responding to the storms of life in the flesh instead of responding to the storms of life in the, by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual shipwreck falls into eight categories. I'll run through them quickly. Category number one of spiritual shipwreck, doctrinal failure on central key doctrines of the faith. Doctrinal failure, and we saw in particular the ones that dealt with the resurrection. That's always the center of Satan's attack. That's where we fight the first very bloody battle of the spiritual warfare. That's always where Satan wants to attack. The resurrection and the inspiration of scripture. And Jude talks about that in Jude 1.3. I hope you're here on Wednesday evenings when we're going to be studying these pseudo-Christianity groups that are out there that claim to have the truth, but they have involved and mixed in pagan theology. That doctrinal error is called the snare of the devil. We looked at that in detail. The second area of shipwreck is moral failure. Number one, doctrinal failure on the key doctrines of the faith. Number two, moral failure. Paul warns against iniquity. That's the word that's used for moral failure. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity is moral sin. That includes all the many normal forms of sex outside of marriage, as well as all perverted forms of sex that are forbidden under all circumstances. Keep away from moral sins if you want to be a clean vessel used by God. Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. The third area of spiritual shipwreck that we looked at is temptation to the other deadly sins. Gluttony, sloth, greed, wrath, lust, envy, and pride. And of course, that connects iniquity with the very first of those sins, which is lust. But it's only in a long list described by Paul in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 32, including the popular modern sin of both male and female sodomy. And the passage ends with these words, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That should give a very clear warning that any sin that we stubbornly refuse to confess and from which we stubbornly refuse to repent is like a perverse jammed rudder that always ends our ship on the rocks of destruction. God says the death penalty is the wages of sin. The fourth area of spiritual shipwreck that we looked at is temptation by the temporal things and the standards of the world. And that we saw includes the way in which we deal with other believers when we insist on our rights rather than our, our responsibilities. You can always be perfectly right under the law and still make shipwreck. 
The fifth area of spiritual shipwreck was a combination of doctrinal and moral sin. We saw that illustrated by two churches in the book of Revelation. Pergamos, which had two separate false doctrines, and Thyatira with Jezebel, who was leading the church in the book of Revelation. The sixth area of spiritual shipwreck is yielding to the temptation to walk in the flesh rather than to walk in the spirit. And we saw the specific way that God gave to us to avoid those kinds of spiritual shipwreck. It's a command. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That implies moral responsibility on our part. That implies accountability. That implies that we're making choices to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh because it is given as a command. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. You can't do what you want to do, which you know is right, unless you are walking in the spirit. The flesh never allows you to do what is right. And he lists all the works of the flesh. Or at least he lists a big list. It's not complete. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. That means there are more of them, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things, now get this last phrase, it's important, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For he that soweth to his flesh shall, guaranteed, of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall, guaranteed, of the spirit reap life everlasting. And Paul talks about that war in Romans chapter 7, the war between the flesh and the spirit, Romans 7, 18, Romans 8, 1, Romans 8, 5, Romans 8, 8, Romans 13, 14, Romans 16, 17, and Ephesians 4, 14. There's a lot of discussion about that in the New Testament. The seventh area of spiritual shipwreck is the temptation to embrace demonic doctrine. You know, Satan is out there and he has his doctrine. Just like true Bible-believing Christians have doctrine, Satan has his doctrine also. Paul warns about it in 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and folks were living in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. In other words, they've been in the church, they know what the truth is, they say, we have a better idea that we just got. Where did they get it? He tells you, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The word translated devils there is daimonion, which is the word from which we get our word demon. There's only one, the devil, Satan, but there are many demons. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, their conscience nags them and says, you know, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right. So they burn it so they don't have any more feeling. Here's some of the doctrines forbidding to marry. Commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Listen, folks, those are doctrines of demons. Know anybody who teaches those? Very serious issue. Commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. There are a lot in the so called Messianic Judaism movement that are putting you back under the dietary regulations of the Old Testament. That's doctrines of demons, folks. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Paul says you need to preach this, not something to avoid, just to keep people from being unhappy with you. He says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. That's in contrast to the doctrine of devils back in verse 1. Whereunto thou hast attained. In other words, you know the truth, preach the truth, live the truth. Every one of us, that's a good command for us. Know the truth, preach the truth, live the truth. You can say this to somebody who brings up some false doctrine, which you look at this passage and you say, you know what, that's not just a doctrine of the flesh. That's not just a, uh, some kind of a weird idea. That's a doctrine of demons. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Oh, I wish we had time to talk about the profane and old wives' fables, but that's not part of tonight. The eighth area where a believer can make shipwreck is the sin unto death. And we talked about that in somewhat detail last week. First John chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. 
And he talks about praying for somebody who has not sinned sin unto death and not praying for somebody who has sinned a sin unto death. We learn more about what is not a sin unto death over in James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, where a man who has committed a sin, he knows God's about to kill him because of that. He calls for the elders of the church. He confesses his sin. He repents of it, and the elders pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And it's not his faith that raises him up. It's got to be the faith of the elders. Isn't that interesting? You know, most of your modern faith healers say, well, you don't have enough faith to be saved. You don't have enough faith, excuse me, to be healed. And so it's your problem because you're not healed, not my problem. Here, James talks about it. It's not one guy who's a faith healer. It's a group of elders who are praying for the man, and it's because he has committed sin. We talk about the different kinds of conditional clauses in the passage. There are, There's a condition, you know, where they're praying for him. If he has sinned, and he has, if he has sinned and he doesn't know whether or not it's sin, or if he has sinned and it's not the case. This is the case where if he has sinned, yes, it is the case that he has sinned. And so he calls for the elders of the church because he knows that's the reason God's about to pull him off the field. We learned about the severity of the sin unto death, which is stubborn, willful sin in many different categories. We'll not go through all of those again. But we find that God judges believers. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25 through 31, where he closes with the words, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And you say, well, how do we know that's not unbelievers? Because the very preceding words say, the Lord shall judge his people. That brought us to the contrast with the unpardonable sin, which is not the same as the sin unto death. The believer cannot make shipwreck with the unpardonable sin because it's unpardonable and a truly saved person cannot commit the unpardonable sin. Otherwise, he or she could not be saved. We saw the unpardonable sin mentioned in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not mentioned in the gospel of John. Only one of the three synoptic gospels, that is the gospel of Mark, defines the unpardonable sin, although we see how it applied last week to both other gospels where it is mentioned. And the unpardonable sin is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And then he explains it in verse 30, because they, that is these Pharisees from Jerusalem, because they said, he, that is Jesus, hath an unclean spirit. They said that the Holy Spirit, who was working in Jesus, performing miracles, that they saw that they had to make a choice. They knew it was a supernatural power that was working through Jesus. They said, well, the only way that he could do that is if, in fact, he has a demon inside him to be able to do those miracles. And that was the unpardonable sin. That brings us tonight to swimming on a full stomach, the verses that we just read a few moments ago. We learn a number of very important principles from this section. Principle number one. I hope you're taking notes. See everybody sort of lollygagging out there. You need to be taking notes. These are principles that you can live by. Number one. Sometimes there are things that are outside of our intuition. Sometimes there are things that are outside of our intuition. You know, emotions are a very unstable guide. A lot of people run on the basis of their emotions. How do they feel about something? But emotions are a very unstable guide. You need to be careful about following your emotions when they walk outside of the revealed scriptures. So well, the Bible hasn't spoken to this issue. Well, yes, the Bible has spoken to every issue of human life. You may not know where it says anything about it, but the problem is not that it has not said something about it. The problem is you have not studied it and found it. And if you are seeking the truth, and if you are studying God's word, you will find the truth. Jesus said, praying to, for us, John chapter 17, sanctify them, 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you do not have to function on the basis of your emotions or on the basis of your intuition. You may not know the answer. You may be struggling with it. You don't know right now at the moment how to solve this particular problem in your life. There is one touchstone and one touchstone only to which you can go and you will find the answer in God's word. There are principles that God lays out. Like for example, I remember back when I was in college, one of the big issues was the Bible doesn't say, and this is stupid college thinking, sophomore moronic, the Bible doesn't say anything about thou shalt not smoke. 
I got so tired of hearing stupid college arguments like that. No, the Bible doesn't say these words, thou shalt not smoke. And it does not say, thou shalt not take heroin, thou shalt not take marijuana, thou shalt not take angel dust, thou shalt not take, you know, and go through a big list of thou shalt not. But what it says is, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If any man defile the temple of the Spirit of God, God will destroy him. That's a pretty clear statement that covers a whole raft of different problems that moron sophomores in college think the Bible doesn't say anything about this. The Bible has all the principles that are necessary for every issue of human life. You don't have to go on intuition. You don't have to go on emotions. You have the Word of God, and if you honestly approach the throne of grace and say, Lord, I don't know how to deal with this situation, would you show me in your Word? And it's not the open the Bible, point a finger kind of a thing. You know, which we have down there. Uh, if two of you agree on anything on earth, touching anything, they'll ask, it will be done unto them, and my Father which is in heaven. You know, that's not the way you find God's truth. Every one of you has access, because you live in America, to what's called a concordance. If you buy one from Christian book distributors, you can oftentimes get, it's like a 2,000 page, humongous book like this for like 19 bucks. You can afford 19 bucks. It lists every word in the entire Bible. I use concordances all the time. That's how, even though I've been studying the Bible for more years than I'd like to tell you about, I still go to the concordance because I don't know every one of the references. When I have a question, I think to myself, you know, what topic would that fit under? What would God have discussed this particular issue under. And I can go and I can find in my concordance a general area and then I begin to narrow it down as I look at the verses and then I discover like I went through the 12 different words that are used for wall in the Old Testament so we can determine which word for wall, and I gave you all of those words this morning, which word for wall is the word that is used for the, the walls of water that stood up on either side of the Jews as they fled from Pharaoh and crossed the Red Sea. And it gives you some insights into the text and some insights into the magnificent power of God when you learn what that word is. And in an English concordance, you see the English word and then you have a number off to the side. And you'll see there are some numbers that are just square block numbers. Those are the Old Testament references. And so you're going to look in the Hebrew part of the concordance in the back where you go to that number, it gives you the Hebrew word and it gives you an English definition of that Hebrew word. And if you see it with slanty numbers off to the side of it, that means it's in the Greek part of the concordance. And you look back to the back part, and there, sure enough, you look at that number, and there's the word and the, the translation of it and what it means. Now, folks, it takes some work. But if you want to live in the center of God's will, somebody else did the real work by producing that concordance over two, to almost 200 years ago. And you can study what God says about that issue. You don't have to live by emotions and intuition. You know, um, as we look here in our text, God always reveals himself in his word. And the Apostle Paul was receiving direct revelation from God. We don't get that anymore from God today. That finished with the close of the canon, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 and following. Paul talks about when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in, uh, imperfect shall be done away. And he's been talking about it in the, tongues of, uh, in the context of tongues and prophecies and so on like that. And he said those are all partial gifts. What is the perfect that comes? Well, it's not talking about the return of Christ because it's in the neuter. It's not in the masculine. What is complete, final revelation of God? That's completion of the New Testament. After the completion of the book of Revelation, which took place in about 96 AD, the word of God was finished. And John says, if anybody adds to this, God's going to add the plagues of the book to him. If anybody takes away from it, his name's going to be taken out of the book of life. The Bible is complete. God's full revelation to man is here. You've got it. You can read it in your own language. It's true. You can study it. Don't go on the basis of intuition or a spirit spoke to you or you had a rumbling in your stomach which might have been just a bad pizza from last night. Go on the basis of God's word.
Paul had a direct word from God because he, as an apostle, received new special divine revelation concerning both the present and the future. You know, you think about that for a moment. They had been going through a fast for two full weeks. Have you ever fasted for two full weeks? So this was 14 days they hadn't taken any food. That's two full weeks. They'd been out on a big boat in the middle of a big storm. You know, you'd get really seasick if you suddenly ate a bunch of food after being on that boat, wobbling around in the middle of a storm, practically drowning every day. And then you take a big meal, you know what happened? You'll probably throw it overboard. Also, when you eat a lot of food after a fast, some of you who have fasted know this, you may have digestive problems. If you start stuffing it down, that's when the Allies came in and they, they liberated those prisoners from the German concentration camps. Many of the prisoners wanted to gorge on food because they hadn't had anything to eat except maybe a rat every two or three days that they managed to catch with their bare hands and strangle and eat raw. But the Allies were very careful not to let them overeat even though they were desperately hungry because they knew what the effects would be. Here are people who've gone two full weeks without eating anything on board this ship. But you know what? They went against intuition. They went against what they knew about being seasick. They all ate because they believed the word of God that Paul had spoken to them. And you know something else about that? That simple act set the stage for Paul's later ministry to those people on the island when they saw more supernatural events at work. The first confirmation that Paul spoke the truth from God was that every one of them lived through the shipwreck, even the ones who couldn't swim. Now that's incredible. I mean, the ones that are strong swimmers, even they, it's, it's doubtful that they would have all made it to shore, except God guaranteed it. And certainly the ones who didn't know how to swim at all, just hanging on to boards, hoping that a wave would carry them into the shore and not smash them on rocks, they all lived through the storm. And then later they see the Apostle Paul when a snake bites him, comes out of the, the sticks that he's gathering for the fire and bites him, and they all think he's going to drop down dead. You know what? Those people began to realize this man is from God. This man is speaking us the truth. Maybe we should pay attention to what he has to say about salvation as well about what happens to ships and people in storms and what happens when somebody gets bitten with a snake and all that kind of stuff. They suddenly began to realize he has something far more important to tell us. You know, we look at those exciting elements of the story, but what's really exciting is to see people who trusted in Christ and received eternal life. The world focuses on all this miraculous and all the big exciting stuff. That's what all the big hero movies and all that kind of stuff are about. But the greatest miracle of all is when a man who is spiritually dead or a woman who is spiritually dead trusts in Jesus Christ and gains eternal life that will never ever, ever stop. Number two, note something very interesting also. Everybody followed the directions of Paul at this point. Everybody on board the ship. You know, after all, they had nothing to lose. You know, if, if they ate, uh, they might die. If they didn't eat, they might die. <laughs> so hey, why not go down to the full stomach? They had nothing to lose. You know, sometimes the way, in fact, the only way that people will ultimately respond to the word of God is when all human hope has been taken away. The text specifically said, after they'd been in this storm many days, then all hope was taken away. Sometimes God has to bring people to the point where there is no human hope. And God often does that in the life of those who are struggling against him. Do you know anybody like that? Somebody who's fighting against God. Somebody who shakes his fist in the face of God. Doesn't want to hear anything about it. You know, God is very kind when he brings that person to the end of their rope. That's an act of kindness by God. Putting them in the impossible situation so that they have nowhere else to turn except to him. Do you have some loved ones that are like that? That hate God? That struggle against God? That pretend he's not there? That pretend if he's there he doesn't care? 
when you pray for them, realize that God might, in fact, bring them to a crisis, maybe to death's door. Maybe some horrible disease, maybe some awful automobile accident whereby they are paralyzed. All kinds of things can happen in the life of an individual, and then they have to make a choice. They can respond with hatred, God, why did you do this to me? I think of someone like Stephen Hawking, who had a brilliant mind, but a deformed body. He did not want to admit that there was a God, but he made the statement himself that when you talk about origins ultimately, the concept of God can't be left out. Even he recognized the fact that that really is the only ultimate answer for why everything exists. Most people who are unsaved use every human effort to solve their own problems and they don't give up until there are no other options. Just remember, God may have to take those people to the final breaking point before they yield to his irresistible grace. Number three, notice here in the text, the sailors, the soldiers, everybody did their human best to bring the ship safely to land. They did their human best wasn't enough, but they did their human best. You know, that's not necessarily wrong because we must always act on the basis of faith when God gives us the option of acting. Now, sometimes you don't have that option, but here they had an option of what to do. They could have simply sat there and waited and see if the boat would make it into the shore by itself, but they didn't. They cut the ropes, they hoisted the mainsail, they steered the rudder, heading toward that creek that they saw on the shore, they did their best. They acted on the basis of faith because they heard what Paul said. They took the meat. They said, all right, boys, let's go for it. You know, for example, there are sometimes you don't have the options, like when Peter was chained up in prison between four quaternions of guards. That's 16 men, 16 Roman soldiers guarding one guy. And he's chained. He didn't have any options about acting until the angel came in. There was a light that shone in the prison. The angel smote him on the side. His chains fell off. The angel said, get up and get dressed and get out. And so he did. Peter, though, had to get up, get his clothes on and walk out, even though the angel awakened him and the angel was one that opened the prison doors. If Peter had rolled over and said, I think it's a dream, he'd still be lying in prison. <laughs> or he'd be dead today, of course. Acts 27, 38. Here they're acting. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. That was where they were going to make their money. Have you ever thought about what it would be if you had to give up everything that you owned? The shipmaster is going to be giving up his ship. He's hoping still to be able to save his ship. He's willing to give up the cargo, though. That's where he was going to make his money. And they all threw it overboard. In fact, they had already cast out the tackling. That is all the gear that the ship used. In verse 39, And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust the ship. They examined their options, and they took what they thought was the best possible course in light of the circumstances. When they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. Number six, excuse me, number four. Sort of as an aside, it is not wrong to be careful about your health. Some people let themselves just sort of fall into a shambles. They don't worry about their health. You know, that's the opposite extreme. Some people are fanatics about their health. That's all they think about. They're focused on temporal things. Other people go the other direction. They don't bother what they eat. They'll eat any kind of junk. They don't bother about whether or not they're eating too much or too little. You know, they let themselves, they dress in a disheveled way. They don't care for their personal appearance. They, ah, well, who cares? It's life. You know, I've met a lot of people like that. They don't care about anything anymore. But Paul says, 
This is for your health. He exhorted them to eat. It was necessary for their health. They're going to need it when they got safely to shore. It's not unspiritual to take proper measures to care for your health. But you don't go nuts over that. Number five, there are always some things in life that you can't control. Have you discovered that? <laughs> how, many knows, how, how many of you know that there are some things in life that you can't control? Raise your hand. <laughs> we're, all, we're all on that page, aren't we? We've been there. There's stuff that we wanted to go the other way and it didn't go the other way. Things in life that you can't control. Even as these sailors were doing, even when you've used all your skill, done all of your very best, and you know that you're obeying God. Were they obeying God by sailing towards shore? Yes. Were they using all the skill they had? Yes, because they thought their lives were depending on it. Were they doing their very best with every muscle in their body? Yes. There are some things you can't control in life, but that's not an excuse for refusing to act. God expects us to act on the basis of his word in the circumstances of life in which we find ourselves and to do what is necessary, even though it won't be our actions that save us, but God expects us to walk forward by faith. Number six, and this I think is important. There are always unexpected dangers that you might never have taken into account. There are always unexpected dangers which you might never have taken into account even when you try to plan your very best moves to obey the will of God. But there are some dangers out there you might not have thought about. I suspect that there, this was a danger right here that they hadn't thought about. They were looking at the other dangers. They were looking at the waves. They were looking at the rocks. They were looking at the ship getting beat up. They were looking at the fact that they were that they'd lost all the food in the ship. They were looking at the fact they'd thrown all the tackling out. They looked at the fact that they'd cut off the the lifeboat. You know, they're looking at a lot of different dangers around them. But here's one they probably hadn't thought about. Look at verse 42. The soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. I think at that moment, none of them were focused on the soldiers, but the soldiers were looking out for their own skins. All the way through, the soldiers are looking out for their own skins. And they think, man, if any of these guys get away, even if one of them gets away, even if 275 of us make it on shore and one of these guys gets away and we don't find his body, you know, if we find his body, we can say, well, he drowned. So, hey, that's the end of that prisoner. But if we don't find his body, it's our lives are going to be forfeit if one guy gets away. I mean, even though it's an island, he might hide out on the island. How, do, how are we going to be able to find him? I mean, if it was a mainland, they definitely would be afraid that they wouldn't be able to find him. But hey, maybe you could find him on an island. But they were, they were so paranoid that one prisoner would get away. It says they were counseling. And probably Paul looked across and he saw these guys standing there huddling and they're pointing different prisoners and they're going like this. And So Paul says, hey, you better not let them kill the prisoners. And the centurion agrees. The centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea. <laughs> the soldiers were worried that one of them would swim and get away. Uh, maybe they thought, well, okay, if we're going to obey the centurion, we'll let those guys go last and the rest of us who can't swim. And most of the soldiers couldn't swim. They knew the sailors could swim, but most of the soldiers probably couldn't swim. So they think, okay, let's the rest of us get on boards and see if we can make it on shore. And then we can stand there, and as they're coming in swimming, we can grab them one by one and make sure we got a full prisoner count here. The centurion said, no, we're going to send the swimmers out first. Unexpected dangers that you may never have taken into account. And right now, you probably can't think of what those unexpected dangers you have are because they're unexpected. But recognize that there may be some, even when you plan your very best moves to try to obey the will of God. You remember a situation happened earlier in the book of Acts where there was a prisoner who got away. You remember Peter in the prison we just mentioned a moment ago, the angel came 
kicked him in the side, woke him up, told him to get dressed and get out. And the angel went and opened all the doors in front of him. I mean, they opened of their own accord until we got to the gate of the city and that opened of its own accord. And Peter walked out one street with the angel and suddenly looked around. He wasn't there. And then Peter thought about it and said, where should I go? And he went to the house of John Mark where they were praying for his escape. <laughs> and when he knocked on the door and Rhoda went to the door to answer the door and she was so excited that she came back and said, Peter's standing at the door. And they said, no, it's not. It's impossible. We're praying for his escape, but it's impossible. They didn't believe what they were praying for. And Peter kept on knocking until somebody came to the door and said, sure enough, it's Peter. They let him in. What happened to the soldiers? Herod questioned them. Peter couldn't be found. 16 men were killed by Herod because they let one guy escape. Principle number seven. God always has an unexpected source of help to prove that he is in control. Principle seven. God always has an unexpected source of help to prove that he is in control. To prove that he's sovereign above the purposes of men. Remember, it said the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners. That was their purpose. The centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. God always has an unexpected source of help to prove he's in control and sovereign above the purposes of men. The centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. Did you know that the purposes of God can, uh, the purposes of men can never thwart the purposes of God? Never. It doesn't matter how many bad actors are around you, they can't thwart the purposes of God. Now, you can go through storms in life. But they are always according to the will of God to conform you to the image of Christ, to make you into the man or woman of God that God wants you to be. How do we know this? Romans 8.28. And we know, not we guess, not we think, not we hope. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't just say all things work together for good because you look around the world and you see that all things are not working together for good. It's to a specific group of people that these things are working for our good. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to the what? Purpose of his will. There's the purpose of God set in contrast with the purpose of men. Men are trying to, to destroy the faith. Men are trying to kill Christians. Men are trying to get you to compromise. Satan is always on attack and you're always on the defensive wearing the spiritual armor of Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20. But the devil himself can't thwart the purposes of God. God raises up help, unexpected help, to prove that he's in control and sovereign above the purposes of men. Here's a man, a Roman centurion, a man who was in charge of many other soldiers, a man who was a hardened soldier, a man who understood his responsibilities to Caesar, a man who knew that he himself could lose his life if one prisoner escaped. And God used that man in control of the other soldiers who had to obey him to save the life of Paul and in so doing to save the life of every other prisoner and fulfill the word of God that every one of them would make it safe and alive to land. God can use people that you would never expect to thwart the evil purposes of men. Number eight. And we'll close here. Our time is up. Number eight. God's word is always true and is fulfilled to the letter. Remember, there are 276 people in a humongous hurricane that has, in the sovereign hand of God, directed this boat to an island they did not even know when they got to the island what it was, but God got them there because God had a further purpose on the island, which we'll talk about later, because there were people on the island that God wanted to hear the gospel and get saved. And so God kept his word that all 276 of them were going to make it alive to that island. His word is always true. It's fulfilled to the letter. Not one was lost. Verse 44. <clears throat> and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, 
And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Never doubt the word of God, folks. That's your touchstone, not your emotions, not your intuition, not some kind of special revelation that you think you've got. Thy word is forever settled in heaven. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word gives light unto my feet, and a, uh, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's the word of God to which we are always pointed. That's what Psalm 119 is all about. That entire psalm deals with the word of God. 176 verses about the Bible itself about its value, about its purpose, about its direction, about its power. God has a lot to say about his word. And those who question the word of God demonstrate they do not believe the God of the Bible because God said, this is my word and this is true. There's where we go, but it takes some work. It takes some study. It doesn't take emotions. It doesn't take, you know, gut feelings. It doesn't take intuition. What it takes is, thus saith the Lord. And on that we can always depend. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. It's clear. It's understandable. And it is always true. No place does it fail. Your word never falls to the ground. Your word is the final and ultimate authority in every test and in every question of life. And we can rely upon it even in the storms of life. And you will show yourself almighty on our behalf to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.